conditions that are regarded by divine right as valid vacant possession and uh, if you look at that point number one we, we covered but let's look at point number two or we did which is you own, you, you owned it but if you look at three under 44.5 three vacant possession is is valid that the land was not otherwise occupied with any permanent tenements or in continued use or reserved as public parkland reserve or use. So if you know of land that is not otherwise occupied with any permanent tenements or in continued use or reserved as public parkland reserved or use, then we are saying that it is a divine right of you in establishing a primary domicile to occupy land that may qualify under that heading. That's not the only other way. We have another one here, that the land and domicile was otherwise vacant and therefore abandoned by the claimed owner for not less than 90 days with no indication of continued habitation nor continued upkeep of the property nor custodial management of the property or, this is the last one, that the present land and domicile has been continually rented by the member for not less than three years and have demonstrated continued maintenance improvements to the property and upkeep. No one has the right to have someone else pay off their mortgage as a renter and not offer them an opportunity to own the property. I mean, that is, I'm sorry for those people that have investment property. I know that people say, well, I bought it, therefore I have the right. No, every single man and woman, excluding those that choose to be excluded, every single man and woman has by divine right the right of promised land the right of possession occupation for primary for their domicile so i've answered that question they are the other conditions under 44.5 okay great thank you frank all right just a reminder for our callers if you press star eight uh, get in the question queue if you'd like to verbally ask your question we have another question here, Frank. <clears throat> uh, will you share on the Tuatha de Danan or the Dana Life Force, please? All right, okay. Um, well, yeah, we've got a book of uh, the Green Race. The, the Tuatha de Danan is... Uh, there's very little, unfortunately, on um, Irish heritage because Ireland was turned into a car park. And if you remember, I said law of the land, the first law of the land, uh, was the Celtic law of the land, which was the first time that land was claimed and surveyed, and that was called Tora, Tara. And Tara was both a place and sacred scripture of Jeremiah and law. And when the Venetians and the Khazars wanted to become holy, they wanted to be known as the holy, and they wanted to usurp the way of the ancients, they invaded Ireland and they destroyed stone by stone, millions of stones to destroy Tara and therefore destroy the law of the land. Now, in that process, they created a whole range of myths. Now, I'm fortunate, I have to say, that the Tuatha de Danan and some of the stories there have been wholly and thoroughly corrupted. Now, in order to heal there is an epic poem called Book of the Green Race, Libor Clan Glass, L-E-B-O-R-C-L-A-N-N-G-L-A-S. And if you go to one-island.org or Google, you will find it. And that is Book of the Green Race. If you read that, that's what I'd be referring to. I, I, I'm not going to answer any more about the story of the uh, Tuatha de Danan because when you get into some of the, the, the cycles, uh, it wholly corrupts. And that's why I don't get into it. All right. All right. Thank you, Frank. All right. What are your thoughts about Gene Keating saying that birth certificates are registered with the Depository Trust Corp, which is controlled by the Jesuits? Well, yeah. I mean, let's talk about the first part of it. Um, absolutely, they're, they're securities. Uh, why? Because we've actually found the IRS documents as forms 
And one of the list of securities that they have there is a birth certificate. So we actually have cold, hard proof from IRS themselves in their own documents and forms that birth certificates are listed as one of the key forms of securities. So clearly, if it is a form of security, a security must be registered for the DTC in order to get a QCIP number. So clearly they are viewed as, as securities. Now, in addition to that, we are dealing with a system of slave roles and the salvage of souls. And from 1540, as I explained, there's been a system of control where the conveyance of the key apparatus of the Catholic Church was conveyed to the Jesuits. And then the Jesuits have used that apparatus and conveyed it to other parts of the world, beginning with London and then later into America. So that one can view Delaware as the central location now for the Chancery. One can view uh, the District of Columbia um, uh, as the Treasury. So um, these, these elements uh, are there now and used. Uh, the Jesuits are up to their eyeballs in running the back end of the banking system and controlling the system of slave roles that we are all trying to have ourselves removed from. But why we are not going to provincial generals and why we're not going to the uh, superior general in the first instance is to prove a point. And the point is this. If there is no remedy in the system, the system is unlawful. In other words, if a registrar can register a baby onto the slave roll that either does not know or cannot or will not remove the said baby as an adult, then the system is unlawful. It does not hold that they can register at a teller, a registrar, registrar in North Virginia or in Virginia or North Carolina or, or somewhere and that it can only be one place in the world that you can get off. That is a perversion. So yes, the Jesuits are far from um, innocence in this. They are up to their eyeballs. But, but here's the thing. There is a war going on at the moment, and the lesser of evils is this. We have one group who are criminally insane, parasites, mental illness, and quite frankly, wouldn't think twice about blowing us up or the rest of the world. And then you have a highly intelligent group of people who are also running a very evil system. In the cho choosing of the lesser evils, the Jesuits have chosen at this point at least to show some honour. But if they do not address these issues, then well before, well before the day of judgment at the end of this year, all the Jesuit system itself will be placed in dishonour. So I hope that answers that question and, and also the logic and the strategy of, of how we're moving forward. Yes, uh, very, very good. Thank you, Frank, for answering that question. Uh, it has been discovered a, a while back that that was where the birth certificates were being held or warehoused, so to speak. So, um, Ryan, if you would please star eight to put your question uh, verbally to Frank, that would be uh, maybe better to do it that way for your question regarding the writ. Uh, okay, next question, Frank. Uh, would you use an appeal demur process with the intimidating judge, or do you still suggest it's safer to forget it? No, I definitely use demur. Now, Demura is, is, uh, is one of these things that, unfortunately, has been gathering dust in the background of, of uh, history of law. And in fact, it's been so um, rare, it even is mispronounced. And you'll hear people call it Demura. Demura is, is uh, something totally different than Demura. So what I've done is, is revealed on the system here under entering a plea, when you had to succeed a court entering a plea, you'll see there's a section there about um, the definition of demurra. 
And demurra means literally to uh, pause as a matter of law and until uh, the matter is resolved. And this is an ancient right and can be called at any point in the proceedings. Now, what a demurra is, is think of it in terms of a battle, in an adversarial battle, think of it as a ceasefire. A demurra is, is honoured as a right on either side to cause a ceasefire for a matter to be resolved, which is, uh, which is intrinsic to uh, the case being um, uh, due process. If a judge does not agree, and the judge does not have to be the one that hears the matter being raised under demurra, if the judge does not agree, then one nearly needs to put on the record that it will immediately be be the basis of an appeal as a matter of law. And the judge then knows that by their denying it and being on the record, that the case is already fatal. So I would absolutely... Uh, read on demurra, research on demurra, and understand that is it is a right at any point in the proceedings. If you've got a judge that is railroading and out of control, that's why it is there. All righty. All right, Frank. So you did say that was under the um, how to succeed at court. Uh, it is under other entering court, a plea. Entering a plea. Uh, yes. Okay. On how to yeah. succeed at court. And you yep. can read about the murder um, right there. Yep. Okay. All right. Let me go back to the phones here real quick for a uh, question. Ryan? Hello, Ryan, are you there? Oh, are you I'm there? sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm muted here. <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, Frank. Um, about the uh, the writ of, I was looking at the writ of habeas corpus. There, yep. it addresses the the um, official who is responsible for the incarceration of somebody. I would assume yes. that would be the judge, right? No, great writs will go to, to much higher than a judge. You would never issue a great writ simply at a judge. You would always issue it at a at a, um, a state um, attorney or a governor. You would never be issuing a, a, a great writ at just a judge level. Okay. Well, the, my, uh, my, my, my question there is it, it addresses their trust number and their live-born records. So how would you access that without – I mean, I, I guess you'd have to find out their birthday, their full name – the time that they were born so that you could properly have their trust number and their LBR. That's right. Well, um, given a governor and a state, um, uh, a state uh, a attorney general, uh, well-known public officials, um, that information should almost always be easily searchable on Google. Okay. And well, yeah, asking, yeah. And if you're asking about the, it would have been an issue if you were trying to issue a writ at a judge level. But the one of the things that's taking time on the great writs is great writs. When you replay back what I spoke about tonight, and I and I think it's worth doing it. Go back and have a listen to what I was saying earlier. A great writ is such a serious document that when it's issued, it can only be issued to senior senior officials. It cannot be used at some judge level, magistrate, district attorney. It's got to be issued at a senior level because it is, a, it is a primary point of law. Now, if someone has been incarcerated unlawfully and that there is overwhelming evidence, then it is an injustice not just at a county, but it's at a state, it's at a national, it's at a global level. Yeah? It's, a, it's a divine injustice. Yeah? Now, I, I don't wish anyone to be suffering, and I know jails are full of full of innocent people but it's again another reason why this can only really be done for those that clearly have been unjustly treated and uh, you'll find that the information for birth 
of a um, of an official at a level of a governor is easily a 